Hello again, welcome back. In this video, I'm going to show you this sort of weird thing that I've got on the screen that I've created. It's known as the game of life, and it's a kind of mathematical simulation. I've written this using Z80 assembly on my RC2014 computer again, and this was possibly one of the most tricky things I've ever created, ever. Okay, last time's little zombies game was pretty complicated, but this was an order of magnitude more complicated. And what I want to show you in this video is what I did, kind of the things that I've written in the code, how it works, and some information about what this Game of Life thing is if you've never seen it before. In fact, that's probably the best place to start. Life is something created in 1970 by a British mathematician, and it's an example of something called a cellular automaton. The idea is that there's like this world that's a 2D grid, and it's got inside it cells and the cells can either be alive or dead and there's a few rules that dictate which state a cell is in and all we do is we set the initial conditions and then the rules take over and from that you end up with all these like really interesting patterns and little things that seem to move about even though there's nothing in the code that says that anything should even move so we'll look at these rules because there's not many of them and they're fairly straightforward they seem that not that interesting. Like, a living cell with two or three neighbours stays alive. A living cell with more or less than that dies off. And if it's a dead cell, it can come alive again if it's got two live neighbours, and only two. Other than that, the cells remain dead. Now, a neighbouring cell is simply one cell and the eight cells around it. So if you look on the little diagram on the screen, that white cell in the middle, the purple squares around it are its neighbours. That's the entire set of rules. That's all there is. That seems quite simple and kind of boring, but people have figured out that you can create almost computer code with it. It's possible to make logic circuits like AND gates and OR gates from this stuff. It's the exact same idea that in Minecraft people have created computers and all this kind of clever stuff, even though when they were creating these things, that was never designed into it. It's an example of something called emergent behavior, which is really interesting stuff to look at. To make this simulation work, I've got to somehow simulate a grid with cells on it that can be alive or dead, and then this logic that does those rules. And that's what I've got to figure out. So I've got a fairly simple algorithm, split into three main parts. I've got to simulate the board, so finding the neighbors and applying the rules. Then I've got to print that board on the screen, which just means going through all the cells in the board, and if they're alive, somehow representing them on the screen. That's those little at signs that you saw. Then I've got to do some swapping over of boards, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. Okay, so here's how this code works. I've got two things that I'm calling buffers. This one is buffer one, this one is buffer two. And buffer one is where I've set some cells to be alive. In the code, there's then two pointers that are used to keep track of which buffer we're talking to. The code is then going to read, apply some rules, write, and then swap these two things around. The reason I'm using two is because for each cycle of this code, I need to figure out the what's going on with each one of these cells. So I need to look at this cell, decide if it needs to be alive next time round. I need to do the same with this one and all the others. But if I was to look at this cell and decided it needed to be alive and just change it there, when I came to look at this cell, I'd now be looking at a mixture of the next cycle combined with the current cycle, which would just be incorrect. So what we're going to do is the following little system. We're going to read from the buffer. We're then going to apply the rules. We're then going to write out the result of those rules to the second buffer. We're then going to swap over the buffers. Now this just means taking that back and front pointer and making them point at the opposite one. So the front buffer now points at buffer one and the back buffer points at buffer two. This now means when the code loops back around from the top, we're going to be reading out of buffer two instead of buffer one and we're going to write the changes back into the other one. And this way it means this code in the middle doesn't really care where it's writing or reading from and I just need a piece of logic to swap these two pointers around. Now, the data that I'm storing is nothing that special. It's just a massive long list of zeros 
And if I want to set a cell to be alive, I put a one inside it. So you can see I've set some cells here and there's some more down here as well. Now this looks like a 2D grid, but it isn't really. It's just one massive long line of zeros and ones. So we've just seen a bit of logic and idea about how I'm going to represent the data in the game and some of the logic of how I'm going to get it on the screen and the overall way the code works. But how do I print this board out? It's got zeros and ones and apparently it's a big long list. Well, here's some Python that does the same idea. So I've got some variables that control the height and width of the screen. I've then got the two buffers and in this example they are the width and height multiplied and then I'm just having zeros for every single one. The code that we're interested in is this section here. And all it does is go through every row and then every column, work out an index into the buffer and then print out what's there. Now this is all the code is. It's not many lines, it's quite simple. And if you look on the side of the screen, you can see it running. It just prints out a big grid of zeros. If I was to actually manually type out um, 2000 of these zeros and ones, it would print out a pattern. It's just the same in Z80. And the Z80 looks like this. Now it's longer and it's more complex, but that's simply because you have to write every single thing separately. So whereas in the Python one, I could just write for Y in range screen height, in the Z80 version, I've got to put screen height into a register. I then have to create a loop where I do something and then at the bottom decrement that register and then check whether that register is zero. So this kind of counts backwards, but it achieves the same effect. And if you look, there's two loops here that are combined together. So this inner section is what prints out a row and it decides if it's dead or if it's alive. And then this outer section simply makes the inner section repeat the correct number of times and that's it. But what are we storing this data in? Because it's nice to look at a grid, you know, the game is based on a grid and we just put ones and zeros in the grid. However, computer RAM isn't like that. So if I've got memory that looks like this and it simply counts from zero all the way to the end, I need a way of turning this into a grid. I mean, there's nothing grid-like about this. I simply need to know memory location for one of those ones and zeros that I had before. How am I going to convert that zero or that one into a memory location? I need some sort of math to do this. So I have this piece of code here, which in Python just says X plus Y multiplied by screen width. And I've just written as a single line of code and moved on. And life's that simple in Python. However, in assembly, things are much, much more complicated. The CPU can do addition. It's quite happy with that. In fact, that's the only thing it can do. So it's fine saying that I need to multiply by the width of the screen, okay? But if we look at the instructions that the CPU can actually do, it can only do addition, subtraction, and then some logic instructions, and that's it. In fact, when you look at it properly, subtraction doesn't even exist. It's just addition of negative numbers. And if you look even deeper, negative numbers aren't real. They're just a way of representing negative numbers in a way that behaves like positive numbers. It's a whole nother video I could do. It's just like how addition works in a CPU. It's based on this circuit here called a full adder, which just adds single bits together. And it can tell you whether the answer is a one or a zero. But then if you chain enough of these together, you can actually add 4-bit numbers and 8-bit numbers and 16-bit numbers together. So our little Z80 can't do multiplication. So we need to write the multiplication code ourselves. And how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to go into Google. We're going to type in Z80 multiplication. We're going to click on a link that looks interesting. And we're going to find a piece of code, just like this stuff here, because I'm trying to write a program to do something bigger. I'm not trying to learn how to multiply numbers together. However, back in the day, before we had the internet, I would have probably spent a very long time trying to write my own multiplication routine. 
So we've got a grid and we've got some rules and we've got a strategy for drawing the grid on the screen and we know the rules for calculating what to draw on the screen but there's a bit of a problem with this and it's all to do with the grid and the fact that this is created by mathematicians who have their own view of the world like if they see a 2D grid it extends in all directions for infinity so the idea of this game of life grid is that there's no edges you just carry on forever computers don't like that they need finite things because they have finite storage inside them in my code I'm doing the most common thing which is that you make the top and bottom of the screen be this connected and you make the left and right be connected it's a bit like asteroids where you can fly off one edge of the screen and come back on the other side to be able to do that though we need to be able to give some sort of definition to the neighbors of the cell so that we can talk about them and write code that makes a bit more sense and this is what I've decided. The cell in the middle is the white one, and its neighbours are just labelled by points of the compass. That way I can think visually in my head that the north cell is just, you take one off the y position, and the x position stays the same. It gets a bit weird at the edges though, because if I'm at the top of the grid, and I want to move to the bottom, I need to not go upwards, I need to like, jump to the bottom. And this bit of logic confused me for so long and yet when you look at it it's really quite short often figuring out the problem is harder than the solution itself it's just how things are and all this code does is it loads in the x position it then loads in the y position it takes one off the y position if the y position doesn't go negative we're finished if the y position does go negative it goes into this section here where all we do is replace the y position with the height of the screen and then take one off because we count from zero and then that's it we're done the other corners are the same right so this is the code that i've written and i'm just going to scroll through some bits of it so you can see that at the start i've defined the width and height of the screen and the screen size this is the um, ascii character for a space this is the ASCII character for an at sign. And then this is where the code begins. So to begin with, I'm just printing out the board so you can see it. Then, this is the main loop. All we do is we simulate, we print the board, we swap the screen buffers, and then we jump back around again. And that's it. That's like the whole program. The printing of the board is that loop that I showed you, where we have a loop inside a loop to print out a grid. Whilst debugging, this was a really useful thing because I could make it just print out a grid of ones and zeros to check that printing was working. That way I knew that any problems were in the simulation code. And when you see it in a minute, I had lots of problems with this stuff. It drove me mad. There was times when I just had to stop doing it. It was quite frustrating. Then down here, this big grid is all the ones and zeros of all the data. And you can see like patterns inside it that I've set. This looks like a grid, but it isn't really. It's just how you write it in code. In fact, here, I've defined the other buffer. And I've simply just said it's a block, screen size of size, full of zeros. And that's it. That's the same as doing this, but I had to do this so I could set the ones and zeros. Now, inside the code for the board itself, I have a function that lets me get a specific cell by giving it an x and y coordinate and that calls some multiplication and all that does is works out how far into the back screen buffer I need to move and then just copies out whatever value is there I've got a set cell alive and set cell dead and they do the same thing it's in fact almost identical code except we're setting a cell instead of retrieving it and then this horrific mess is all the code to calculate all the neighbors and I'm sure there's a better way of doing this. This just feels too much like a kind of simple, dumb way to do it. But I was trying to make this work rather than make it work 100% efficiently. So all this does is it goes through all eight cells and works out the coordinates of them. And then goes and gets whatever cell that is. Totals up however many live cells there are. And returns that number. And then another piece of code down here loops through every cell on the grid works out 
how many neighbours are alive, and then, depending on the rules, works out whether that cell should be dead or not. So if you look, we've got an alive cell section, a dead cell section, and then this bit that turns a cell on or off. I'm fairly sure that I can remove some of these loops, because if you see the code running in real life, it's really slow. It's like one second per update. And the slowness is not the drawing on the screen. It's this simulation code. So that was a little tour of the code that I've written. If you're staring at that thinking, oh my god, that's awful, please tell me how to make it better in the comments below. There's a GitHub repository with all the coding that you can look at. In my next video, sat to my left is a BBC Micro, which I'm going to have a play with, because I've just bought a Raspberry Pi Zero for it, and a little board that lets me put the Raspberry Pi inside the BBC Micro, which is a whole strange concept. The BBC has like this idea that you can use coprocessors inside it, and someone has written some code that turns a Raspberry Pi into one. So we'll have a play with that. There's other videos out there about it, but I want to do some programming with this, see what I can make it do. The BBC's got graphics. I'm sure I can make a terrible game of Tetris in 6502 assembly or something. Or maybe compare 6502 with Z80. I don't know, I want to do something with that. So if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, hit the subscribe button. I'm such a tiny channel at the moment that you'll probably never see these videos pop up again. So if you had fun, leave a comment, press that like button down below, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.